Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar, The COVID Roller Coaster, Navigating Your Business, <coughs> excuse me, through the ups and downs of state COVID responses. My name is Jim Scarborough. I serve as Director of Government Relations for the IATMO Group, and I'll be your moderator. We're also very happy to have several co-sponsors today, and I want to take the time to recognize all of them. Sponsoring along with the IATMO Group are the Alliance for Water Efficiency, the American Society of Plumbing Engineers, the Plumbing Contractors Association, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors Association, Plumbing Manufacturers International, and the United Association, the Union of Plumbers, Fitters, Welders, and Service Text. I'm very pleased to welcome two distinguished speakers today. First, we have Texas State House member Armando Wally. Representative Wally um, uh, comes from the 140th district, which is in Houston, Texas. He's also the deputy floor leader of the Texas House Democrats and was <clears throat> recently named, <clears throat> excuse me, Harris County COVID-19 pandemic recovery czar by Harris County Judge Lina Hidalgo. Representative Wally is a strong supporter of the plumbing industry in the Texas legislature, and we're happy to have him here today. We're also pleased to have with us Maryland State Commissioner of Labor, Matthew Hominiak. Commissioner Hominiak has served in this position since 2017 under the leadership of Governor Larry Hogan. Among, <clears throat> excuse me, among the commissioner's other duties, he works with the program managers leading the departments that oversee the Maryland Building Codes, and we welcome him today as also. I'm happy to take any questions uh, that anybody might have, and you should be able to send them in uh, through uh, in written form. Uh, we will hold those until the after both of our speakers have made their presentations and take them all at the end of the webinar. So we will begin with Representative Wally, who will tell us about what is happening in Texas. Representative Wally, the, um, the floor is yours. And let me make sure that I've got you on as a presenter. I believe that I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for that introduction. My name, uh, again, is Armando Wally. Uh, I am uh, one of 150 members of the Texas legislature uh, and each one of our districts uh, covers about, you know, uh, now between 170 and 190,000 people. Uh, I'm situated in Harris County. Harris County is uh, the largest, third largest county in the country. Um, the city of Houston is the uh, fourth largest city in the country. We, we, just to give you a little bit of background about Houston, and, and before I do that, I do want to thank John Mata and Alfred Ortega, the, the, our, one of our locals here, local 68 uh, plumbers and pipe fitters, uh, the Lord family for being uh, great supporters of, of, of ours. Uh, we've worked together uh, with, with the plumbing industry and uh, with uh, contractors uh, uh, that are union shops and not union shops. And so uh, just as an industry uh, in general, work with, with the industry uh, very, very closely. And so I do want to thank them. But but just to give you a little bit of background, so Harris County, for, uh, you know, third largest county is about four to five million people, about 4.7 million people that live in uh, Harris County. 2.2 uh, .2 million people live in what we call the city of Houston. And so you have a, a whole other set of, of residents uh, in unincorporated Harris County um, that, uh, that, that that's a big uh, population in, in our region. And in, in our region, the five to six county region is about six million people uh and so um i think um uh for many of you guys that have that have uh, seen urban cowboy there's a there's a uh, mention in there about uh the term uh, we're about uh 500 square miles of, of concrete prairie uh and so uh it's a it's it's a wonderful city uh but 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 uh it, it, it's a growing city it's a vast city and it's it's a it's a city that that needs people like you guys to help us um, in our economy, help us uh, br br bridge the gap, in, in particularly in your industry, the um, water plumbing industry. And so just to give you, uh, just a dovetail of, of just that background, um, uh, as it relates to COVID and COVID response in Harris County, Texas, unfortunately, we're seeing a, 
uh, just got off the phone with Baylor College of Medicine, actually was on a very similar platform, literally about 45 minutes before getting on with you and getting a briefing from Baylor College of Medicine, which what, they're one of our largest, um, uh, or they're a private uh, um, teaching school. It's a medical school in our region, one of the, the many great institutions we have at the Texas Medical Center. Uh, and so one of the things that we're seeing is a very uh, huge spike in, in hospitalizations, a uh, huge spike also in, uh, they're right now comprising, you know, close to 20 to 30, up to 40% of, of certain hospitalization ICU beds uh, in Harris County. And so uh, in our region, we're also seeing a large number of positivity rates uh, amongst our folks. And, and we have a probably about a 14% positivity rate. And, it, and unfortunately, in certain, in, in certain neighborhoods, um, uh, real quick, and just to tell you a lot of the disparities that we have in our communities, we're, we're largely uh, very diverse. We're probably one of the diverse, most diverse counties in the region, I mean, in the country. Uh, and so uh, we don't have a single majority minority in this, in this region. And so Harris County is a very, to, to the surprise of many people around the country, it's a very, very diverse community. Um, uh, Hispanic, African-American, Asian, Anglo population, just a very mixed uh, community here. And so with that, you do see the, the income disparities and the health disparities that, that we're experiencing in our region, where a lot of our vulnerable populations are being disproportionately impacted uh, by the virus. Uh, and, and so first and foremost, it, it's a public health crisis, right? We have to, uh, acknowledge that and, and we haven't seen this type of pandemic in, in 100 years. Uh, so this is very new to all of us. Um, uh, but also, and, and we're in the business of, of having to save lives uh, throughout the country, but particularly here in Harris County. Also, we have to save livelihoods, right? Because with the shutdown of the economy, uh, particularly in our area, a lot of people were hurting, a lot of businesses and out of your members, a lot of folks in the community, a lot of your workers, uh, weren't able to work. Uh, but we also know that in our area, certain sectors were considered essential workers. So th throughout the pandemic, there were certain industries that were still working. Uh, but maybe some, some, folks, some, uh, some folks didn't have the proper PPE, didn't have the guidance from OSHA or the guidance from uh, their, state, um, uh, their state leadership or particularly again, or their local government. Uh, and so providing guidance was also important uh, because many of those folks, uh, many of our folks in our energy and construction industry, they, they, kept, they kept working. Uh, and so uh, one of the measures that we, we uh, as I was appointed, um, this is my going on my seventh term in the Texas legislature, uh, been in there over a decade, um, you know, come from a working class background. So the, the county judge, Lena Hidalgo, this is her first term in office. She's been doing a great and a tremendous job in our region, leading the recovery and response efforts to COVID. Um, and so one of the things that, that she did was appointed me as the recovery czar to help uh, in, in, in certain uh, uh, recovery efforts because we're doing relief and recovery at the same time. Here in, along the coast and in, in, along the Gulf, Texas Gulf Coast, but along the, the coast uh, in general, we're obviously prone to, to hurricanes, we're prone to natural disasters. We have that down to a science. Uh, emergency response, whether it's a, it's a flood or a hurricane or, or any kind of tropical storm, we, we're very good at, our emergency response folks are very good at that. Uh, and, and with they, that type of storm, natural disaster, we've become experts and leaders in being able to respond to, to natural disasters. Well, the difference in, 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 in a health pandemic like this is that, uh, this is a, it is a, a, a named storm uh, in, in COVID-19, but you can't see it per se, and there's no end to it. There hasn't been a necessary end to it, unlike a storm uh, that, that we get hit uh, pretty often here along the coast. There's an end to those storms, those natural disasters, and we can readily respond uh, with, with first responders uh, at all levels with, uh, um, with rebuilding efforts, with cleanup efforts, we can do that, we do that well. What's very challenging in this time is, uh, is, is there's, there's really no, at this point, no end in sight to, to COVID-19. And so, unless there's a vaccine and people, I mean, healthcare folks and many experts are working on that. 
in the meantime, uh, all that being said, and I'm glad the commissioner is on because there is a, that human component, that component of folks that, that don't have work, that are out of work, uh, that can't get back to the workplace in a safe, because they might be, um, they might be scared to go back to work. Um, and so uh, the county uh, early on implemented a couple of measures with the leadership of, of a lot of our friends in labor, a lot of our industry folks, but to, to, to pass, uh, get requirements, measures passed by commissioner's court, uh, uh, but sometimes actually under her emergency orders to do work safe uh, uh, measures for construction industry and particularly for retail. So providing guidance uh, to those two industries on how to bring back folks online in a safe uh, way, because uh, if, if folks can't, you know, get back to work in a safe way, uh, you know, folks can't get back to business. And so that's one of the things that, that, that the county judge, Lena Dalgo, has, has been very strong champion of that. Stay at home measures have been a, a huge uh, a tool for us to be able to combat the virus. Unfortunately, we obviously have this tug of war between our local, a lot of local county judges and mayors are doing a great job of trying to contain the virus. But unfortunately in, in, in our environment right now, we're, we're getting, in, our, in Texas, we're getting undercut by our state leadership in, in taking away the tools that we've been able to use to combat the virus and get people back to work. Um, um, it's been very difficult to, to navigate those, those, uh, th that bureaucracy or that tug of war between federal, what the federal government's telling you, which we all know is, is the message has just been very, it's uh, chaotic, to be honest with you, uh, to be frank with, with you and, and the membership. Um, what's being told at the federal level, what's being told to you at, at the state level, and then what's told to you at, at, at the county level. And at the local level, we're trying our best to make sure that, that folks are, are, are obviously adhering to all the healthcare guidelines because at this point without a vaccine, our only tools right now are these stay home, safe or stay home measures, but also mandatory mask requirements. Um, but with all that being said, Obviously, you know, with, with the funding that's come through the CARES Act and allowing certain, I mean, allowing most of our states and most of our folks that have been out of work, unemployment insurance, that's been a huge, um, I would say, maybe a, a bridge uh, to uh, staving off evictions. So right now we're in Harris County, we've seen a huge number of evictions. We're seeing a, a huge number of obviously unemployment insurance claims. Uh, we see a lot of folks that, that um, cannot uh, uh, get access to food. Um, and we have a lot of children that, that uh, we need to bridge the digital divide for those folks that, that have school, school age children. Obviously we're in the summer and schools are um, uh, text, you know, education agencies, state agencies are providing guidance to your local uh, school districts. Uh, and so right now uh, planning for how are you going to go work? How are you going to have your kids in school in a safe way, uh, and, and put, but also put food on the table? But but at the end of the day, um, all these all these uh, um, issues are, are are coming to a head where where uh, in a very very um, disproportionate way. And so you have many many families. Uh, just one example: many thousands of families that don't have access to to computers and don't have access, if they have a computer, don't have access to um, uh, internet access, right? So one, one is the device. The other is actually access uh, to being able to connect uh, to your ISDs, right? Or uh, having a device for somebody that's looking for a job that may be out of a work that might've been furloughed. Look, I, I come from a working class background and, and I'll be, uh, I, I'm a close to uh, ending my, my remarks, but uh, my brother's a member of, of, of the local um, uh, IBEW 716s, and he's a union electrician. My mom works in a, he, his hours have been cut. He's working 20 hours a week. My mom was recently furloughed from her job. Uh, and so I, I know intimately what folks are going through uh, on an individual basis, but I also as a policymaker view my work and view the work at the state level, but now, you know, helping our, our region uh, and recovery efforts, I view my work through that lens, through that, my personal experience, but also my professional experience. And so uh, to the 4.7 million people that live in Harris County, 
Uh, it's a huge responsibility and one that, that we work with our local uh, 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 county commissioner's board, uh, obviously uh, commissioner's court. Um, we also obviously, I, we all have to work with our local government. So, so we have Judge Lina Hidalgo, we have Commissioner Rodney Ellis, Commissioner Adrian Garcia, Commissioner Steve Raddick, Commissioner Jack Cagle. Those are the, the five members of the commissioner's court. And then you have the city of Houston, which is uh, you know 15 to 17 members of the city council, uh, along with Mayor Sylvester Turner. And so it's a, it's a huge region, huge responsibility, but be glad to answer any questions, but that's kind of the status of, of what's going on here in Harris County high positivity rates, high hospitalizations, and, and we're, we're desperately trying to get that curve to come down uh, in Harris County from a health perspective, but also help, uh, once we, we were able to mitigate the damage from the healthcare component, we have to help as many people as we can uh, at the federal level, from the federal level down. And, and I'm, look, I, I, I'm hoping that we get a, a second round of, um, of uh, stimulus help for a lot of our folks that, that uh, that are really hurting pretty bad right now. And, 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 and you see that demonstrated in the high un, uh, employment insurance uh, uh, registrations uh, or applications in, in each state. Uh, but I'll stop there and, and commissioner, I, I know they'll, they'll, they'll introduce you, but glad to be on with you. Appreciate the work that, that a lot of our state commissioners do to, to uh, help a lot of our folks that are, that are hurting pretty bad right now. So I'll end my remarks there and, and, glad, and glad to answer any questions. Look forward to, to listening to commissioners' uh, uh, comments as well. Okay, so I'm going to uh, share my PowerPoint. Can you guys see my PowerPoint screen? Let me go back to the page. I didn't see. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And go with PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, that's a little better. So let's run my PowerPoint. Um, okay, so um, I'm Matt Helmeniak, the Commissioner of Labor and Industry. So uh, Labor and Industry is one of the units of the Maryland Department of Labor. Uh, luckily, thank God, I'm not in charge of unemployment, but um, uh, Maryland is a, um, we're a tiny state compared to a lot of the other states. Uh, your county, Houston, has 4 million people. We've got 6 million in our entire state. Uh, so we're a little different than a lot of other states because uh, we have this thing right in the middle of Maryland called Washington, D.C. that um, many of our citizens work directly for the federal government and a lot of the rest of us are contractors or somehow connected to the federal government. So it's, it's always difficult to draw conclusions from Maryland and try to apply them to the rest of the country. Um, our governor, Larry Hogan, um, identified four building blocks to recovery. Um, so it's a very data-driven uh, system we have. It's expanded testing capacity, increasing the hospital surge capacity, ramping up the supply of PPE and a robust contact tracing operation. We have a three-stage recovery. We're in stage two across all the counties right now. We have been in stage two for about a month now. Um, and we have a lot of flexibility at the local level. Uh, counties and, and towns are allowed to be more restrictive, just not less than the state. Um, our shutdown, though we were shut down for a couple months, a large chunk of our workforce wasn't shut down. So there were a lot of parts of the economy that were considered essential, such as construction, uh, manufacturing, um, and a lot of the ones that were non-essential were still able to be done. So a lot of jobs were getting done from home the entire time. If you could do your job from home, you weren't shut down. So the five or 6% of our employees that work directly for the federal government, most of them continued to work. Our state government employees, our school employees all continued to work. Um, I was on a tour last year of uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab as one of the bigger employers in Maryland. Um, last year, before coronavirus was even something that existed, we were taking a tour of one of the, the rooms that they were monitoring satellites. I, I don't think you call them satellites, deep space probes. They were uh, doing a flyby, I think, of uh, Saturn at the time. Nobody was in the room. And we asked where everybody was, and they said they all work from home. So they're sitting in their kitchen. Uh, watching a satellite go by Saturn 
uh, they didn't have to come into the office. The only thing they had to do in the office is if you actually want to make the uh, any changes to the satellite's directions or anything the satellite's doing, you have to do that from the office. Other than that, you don't have to come to the office. So we had a lot of employees in Maryland that are already geared up for working from home. Um, our numbers are pretty good in Maryland. Um, total hospitalizations right now is 392. Actually, it might be a typo. I think it's 1392. No, it's 392. 392 and 114 ICU beds as of early this week. Our death rate has stayed pretty low. Our positivity testing rate has ticked up just a little bit uh, yesterday and today, but we're still under 5%. Uh, as of today, it's 4.45%. Um, where that's a little worrying or worrisome, um, the positivity rate for people under 35 is 84% higher than those over 35. So we've got over 6% of the people under 35 are testing positive, but three and a half percent of those over 35. So that's similar to what we're seeing in a lot of the other states. The people that are out and about and are spreading it are the younger people. The good part about that is their uh, fatality rate is extremely low for younger people without a comorbidity. Um, the bad part is they don't tend to listen and don't think they're mortal. So they tend to circulate even when they're sick. Uh, one of the other troubles we're having is though we have a robust contact tracing system, our local health departments call people to do the contact tracing, but a lot of people don't answer the phone because they think it's a, a junk call. Uh, so one of our other goals is to have at least 10% of our total population in all 24 jurisdictions um, to be tested. Right now, we only have 15 out of the 24 jurisdictions that have met that mark. That's up from 12 on Saturday. So that's we're getting better there. Um, with the reopening um, and during the shutdown, Maryland coordinated all of our information through the Department of Commerce. So we set up a thing called the Maryland Business Express, which was a website that um, all of our other agencies were feeding data into. Um, so when we got a call from a contractor, or from a company, or from an employer, or even a citizen, we could all refer them to the same set of data that was always being updated with current information. Um, the Commerce Department put together uh, advisory groups when we were talking about reopening. They started out with 13 advisory groups, ended up with 15. Their goal was to uh, try to get as much feedback and input from um, different sectors of the economy, like the amusements, uh, construction. Each of them had their own advisory group. And um, the goal was to have industry and commerce work together to provide a set of guidance that people could use when they reopen. Um, so they put it up on this website, openmaryland.gov slash back to business. It worked through how to operate safely, how to reopen safely. They put up something called the back to business pledge, which is a, a pledge that a company can take that uh, they can sign it, print it out, post it in their window. And it uh, shows what the company does to uh, above and beyond the minimum requirements for reopening. Uh, Cause the important thing is even though you're doing stuff, if nobody knows you're doing it, it doesn't count. So, so much of um, inspiring confidence in your employees and in your customers is showing them what you're doing. So it's like uh, when I teach my kids, you got to test and you did the, the math problem, but you didn't show your work. Nobody knows what you did. Same thing with um, your, sanita your sanitation, uh, the things you're doing to space out your employees. If nobody knows you're doing it, it doesn't count. So. The important thing is making employees feel comfortable, making the customers feel comfortable that your business is a safe place to come to and do business with. Um, the uh, data on that website, um, openmaryland.gov, back to business, as of last week, had 151,000 views, um, about 2,500 visits per day. Uh, over 8,000 of the pledge PDFs have been downloaded and uh, posted. Uh, and the best practices and frequently asked questions have been downloaded over 76,000 times. Uh, the most popular were the personal services, restaurants, and retail establishments. Um, masks, we were probably one of the first states to have masks, even though it wasn't a um, statewide mandate. Our governor was a very early adopter of face masks. He had a face mask on in his press conferences starting in early March. Um, one of the unique things we have uh, in Maryland, our governor is very popular. I think his approval rate is somewhere in the mid to upper 70s. 
Um, and even though he's a Republican and Maryland is a mostly Democrat state, um, uh, moderation seems to be the uh, the way we handle most things here. So uh, masks never became a political thing here. Our governor wore them. Everybody that was on the press conferences wore them, and there wasn't a whole lot of pushback. We have a few people that aren't happy about it and um, try to make an example and not wear them. But for the most part, everybody's been wearing masks since early to mid-March. Um, the important thing we have is our governor's team, the Maryland Department of Health, Commerce, Labor, all of us have a consistent message. So we filter the information through one solid website. We got general public buy-in early and people have so far taken it pretty seriously. Um, the business response, some of the things that um, businesses have done that have helped um, with our healthcare industry, we've got a lot of uh, assisted livings that um, I don't know how many of you guys know that much about how assisted livings work, but a lot of them work long 12 hour shifts. So you do a 12 hour shift two or three days a week. Uh, a lot of those employees will work at multiple assisted livings. Um, so you've got infection that can get spread by the employees of the assisted living because it's not the patients at the assisted living that are spreading it around. Uh, the assisted livings and the healthcare started out real early limiting their employees from being able to have multiple jobs and that is allowed under Maryland law. Uh, we also limited non-essential travel. Um, anybody that goes out of state, a lot of employers will still to this day say that if you travel out of state, when you come back, you have to self-quarantine for 14 days. Uh, so um, keeping, keeping people from circulating around too much has helped and our numbers have stayed pretty low. We had a bit of a spike early on, but our numbers have been trending down with one or two days exception for the last couple of months. Um, uh, some of the nice things, when uh, we had our essential businesses, non-essential businesses, that was left up to the employers to decide whether they were essential or non-essential. The um, commerce and the governor put out a list of essential industries, but businesses themselves were allowed to determine where they fell. Um, the executive order enforcement is being handled by state and local police and our masks and social distancing orders are being handled by the local health departments because they're the people that are closest and have the most boots on the ground in the local counties. Um, most of our guidance points from the CDC guidance and I've included that website in case there's anybody that hasn't known where the CDC website is, that's where we get our guidance from and that's the USDOL guidance. Um, for people that are used to reading government stuff, um, I don't know what on earth got into the US Department of Labor, but over the last couple of months, they've allowed someone who's, who writes in uh, understandable English to be writing their guidance documents. So when you go on their guidance and read it, it's shockingly easy to understand. You don't have to be an attorney to understand US DLO guidance these days. Um, also, uh, OSHA puts out frequent updates uh, for all different industries that they cover. If there's anybody on the web or on the webinar that doesn't have access to these OSHA updates, let me know, send me an email and I can forward them to you. But at least once or twice a week, OSHA will put out updated guidance. It's on their website, but this guidance they send out uh, puts it all in one document. Um, so they do a really good job of, of bringing everything together in one document. Um, a couple more websites of ours are COVID-19 facts from the Attorney General, uh, guidance for businesses from the Attorney General, and our Department of Commerce website. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Hominiak no and Representative Wally. Uh, so appreciate you taking the time to do this. I have received any uh, questions at this point, uh, I would ask my co-host uh, if he's gotten any or if I've, any of you have gotten any to pop up, uh, but I have not received any questions at this point. Uh, so um, I'll give this like another 30 seconds to see if somebody has something they want to send in. Uh, and um, uh, while we're waiting on that, uh, I would again like to thank um, all of our uh, co-sponsors today, AWE, ASPE, PCA, BHCC, PMI, and the UA uh, for uh, co-sponsoring this webinar with us.
In our case, we did not shut down the uh, construction industry. For the most part, Pennsylvania directly to our north did shut down construction. And we didn't see a big outbreak in the construction industry from not shutting down. Uh, Pennsylvania's numbers are a lot worse than ours and they were shut down. Um, so um, we didn't see a huge um, spike because of keeping construction open. Okay, I, I've received a question from one of our uh, attendees. Uh, this is for both of you. Have any training centers opened? And are, uh, from the same uh, attendee, are there any written protocols? I haven't seen any of our OSHA training centers open. We send uh, state employees to OSHA training institutes. They've all been either canceled or moved online. Um, our Maryland OSHA, we do a state plan here. So Maryland OSHA does trainings, but everything's been handled online so far. Um, specific trainings regarding coronavirus prevention or what kind of trainings did they say what they were looking for? Uh, did not specify. Um, on our end, we, I mean, it, just in general, we put a lot of guidance uh, on our website, on the county's website, readyharris.org. Um, it, and it, it, it's tailored towards, you know, uh, particular industries, like I mentioned earlier with our work safe order. Um, we, we had, you know, guidance basic, basically based off of uh, CDC guidelines uh, and, and how we, we implemented uh, our, our work safe orders uh, at the county level. At the state level, um, uh, it's it's um, uh, it's limited. Um, but to to the question as far as training centers being opened, I, I wouldn't have any information other than than that. Okay. And the the person who asked the question uh, did try to be more specific. Uh, training centers as an apprenticeship and labor labor union training centers, that kind of thing, uh, is what this uh, attendee was asking. Yeah, I mean that those would be you know each each individual local would would uh, because th the issues you have you can't have certain uh, uh, numbers of people congregating in the in the same uh, area. So I think there's uh, it, it, depending on what what uh, type of facility you have, um, and, and uh, it's a very good question, right? People want to get back to get back to their apprenticeship programs or they want to get back to their uh, to their training. Um, what I've seen some local uh, community colleges do is they, they limit it, the amount of people within their training centers. Uh, at the, so for instance, at a, at a welding shop, not a welding shop, but a welding school at the local community college, they limit it to uh, less than 10 people and they have to stay uh, within six to seven feet away from each other. So that's probably a way that um, mm. they can probably get back online. But that's what I've seen uh, some of our local community colleges do is, is, is in order for them to be in, compli in compliance with local and state guidelines, they, they've been limiting the amount of people in, in the classroom. Well, another one of our attendees said in Las Vegas, they are planning on a full training center opening for plumbers and pipe fitters, UA Local 525. Uh, and he would, uh, if anybody has questions, we could direct them uh, to him as well because he researched and wrote their protocol. So that's uh, good to know. Uh, and then the next question that we have are, what are your expectations in terms of economic recovery in your regions than all over the country? For, for Texas, I mean, we, we, unfortunately for us, for our region, uh, we're dependent on the oil and gas industry, manufacturing industry. And so we have a lot of refineries that, uh, that were up. And so w one of the things that, that was uh, been um, very concerning for us as a region, but as a state is the price of oil um, in, in, in in, in our area, uh, well, in the, in, the, in the country is right before the, um, I guess the pandemic initially hit uh, for us, the price of oil was, was the, the first punch. The second punch was COVID-19. And so we were already, um, um, the, the amount of refineries or the refining capacity was there. We just didn't have a lot of, uh, 
we didn't have the ability to get the product there uh, because we had a lot of uh, oil wells drillers that uh, the oil well drill count was down. And so um, we, we were already suffering from that. And, and based in, in, in Texas, the way we generate revenue, we're, it's more of a consumption. And so we're, our, our local, uh, our state revenue comes from sales tax. And so, um, and, and we do get some, some revenues. Our rainy day fund is actually a tax on, a severance tax actually on, on the energy industry. And so we have about, you know, from eight to $12 billion, give or take, in our rainy day fund. Uh, but, we, but you have to understand as a state, we, we actually, I, I actually am a member of the appropriations committee and got to sit on the, the what we call the conference committee, the, act of the, the committee, the, the committee of the committee that, that actually wrote the budget our budget is, and we run, we run a two-year budget uh, because we're considered a part-time legislature. Um, uh, we meet every odd number a year for 140 days. And so we run a two-year budget. Our, our two-year budget was uh, $250 billion. And so uh, going into this next cycle, um, it's gonna be very difficult. There will be um, already orders from for state agencies to cut um, you know, at, at, at most 5% from their budgets. but um, as a region, we're, we're going we're gonna to take a huge hit um, uh, from COVID, but also the price of oil that's, that's, you know, right now I think at $40, but uh, when it's down into those teens and $20, that's not good for us, probably good for the pocketbook around the country uh, in the, you know, when you're filling up your gas, but particularly for us as a region, it's, it's not helpful <laughs> uh, to us. In our case, um... Our, our biggest industry and in crop seems to be growing federal government employees and contractors. So as long as people continue to pay their taxes to the federal government, Maryland uh, weathers the storm a lot better than in a lot of other states do. So it's, it's not really fair to everybody else, but um, uh, we've fared pretty well throughout this. Uh, I, I sent an email to our uh, apprenticeship chair and they said that most of the apprenticeship training centers are open at some level or they're not at full capacity, but they are open right now. Great, good to know. Um, okay, I have next question for both of our speakers. With the threat of closures this fall and winter on everyone's mind, <clears throat> excuse me, is there anything that can be done to alleviate the economic impacts? What were the lessons learned from the last round of closures? Uh, I guess to us, a lot depends on what, if anything, comes out of Washington. If another bill comes out that pays an extra $600 a week to be unemployed uh, and you incentivize unemployment, uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult for employers to get their people to come back to work. Uh, we get calls all day long from employers that are trying to open but can't get their employees back. And there's two weeks left in the month and then the $600 per week expires. And uh, hopefully that will facilitate a lot of people being able to get back to work. Um, I just hope if they pass another stimulus bill, they incentivize work instead of incentivizing unemployment. Yeah, I think uh, for us, I mean, in any, any um, uh, because we do have a rise of, of evictions, um, I, I mention that a lot because um, a lot of the moratoriums that are uh, going, particularly for federally backed uh, properties uh, around the country, uh, they'll, those moratoriums are going to, for eviction are gonna expire at the end of the month uh, here in August. And so I think any any assistance, particularly for folks that, um, uh, I understand the, the, the point about incentivizing work, I, you know, don't necessarily have a problem with that. Uh, the only thing that, that we would be concerned about is, is um, you know, if we're gonna open safely, which certain industries have been successful in uh, because they have implemented the mask order and they have implemented social distancing, that helps because because those are our only tools at the point at this point to combat the virus. Um, if we're if we're being strict about that, if we're doing that, I think that helps uh, industries uh, open back up and and not having to rely on uh, in, in from an employee perspective, not having to rely on unemployment benefits. Uh, I think that that's um, um, for us. It, it it will always be a public health uh, concern uh, once we get. To mitigate that, it makes it the transition to getting back to work. I think is is 
uh, it's bumpy. Don't get me wrong. It's very bump, bumpy for a lot of people, but, but smoother uh, towards the end. Well, right before the CARES Act went into effect, they had another federal law, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, that took effect April 1st. And that one actually didn't get a lot of notice because a lot of unemployment superseded um, the, the two main provisions in the FFCRA. Uh, one is a federally reimbursed two weeks of sick leave. So an employer with less than 500 employees, if they have a employee that needs to stay off work because of COVID-19, they can pay them uh, paid sick leave benefits and then get reimbursed by the federal government for that. There's also a, a paid FMLA for people who are unable to go to work because they don't have childcare arrangements. Um, and that's gonna kick in pretty solid in about a month when people are scheduled to go, up, to go back to school. And if you don't have childcare arrangements and you can't send your kid back to school, um, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna need to take advantage of those provisions. Your microphone's off. I'm sorry, <laughs> I am unmuted now. That leads into the next question somewhat. Uh, do you see, both of either one of you see your states possibly shutting down through the end of July to try to, to flatten the curve of the pandemic? Uh, for, for us, I mean, it would, it would um, we're seeing such a spike. I, I, I would hope that the governor, you know, Governor Abbott would, would uh, give us back our authority to, uh, you know, shut things down for a while because we, uh, the, the virus is uncontrolled here in Harris County. Uh, and, 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 you know, most of Texas is, is, you know, even though we have this, you know, cowboy, cowboy boot, you know, mentality, um, we're, we're a large urban state. Um, the, the majority of our, our population live in what we call the, the you know, 70% of the people that live in Texas live in what we call this triangle of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Central Texas, Austin, San Antonio, uh, and Houston, Harris County. Uh, those are the three main population centers uh, in the region. Um, uh, El Paso, uh, way out in El Paso, it's, it's, it's large town, large city. Um, and then we have uh, also Rio Grande Valley, you know, 300 miles away <laughs> from Houston uh, is a Rio Grande Valley, about, you know, about a million uh, people that live in, in the Rio Grande Valley. And so uh, any, any uh, authority to be flexible in allowing the large urban counties to at least lock down uh, for the next couple of weeks would be helpful in mitigating uh, the spread of the virus. Yeah, and in our case, we never fully opened. So we're still at, uh, you're allowed to eat in a restaurant, but you gotta wear a mask when you get up from your table, 50% capacity, six feet apart with the tables. Um, no large gatherings outside. If you want to go to church, you got to get tickets and you sit uh, six feet away from somebody or you have mass outside. So we never fully reopened. So ours has been a very phased in cautious approach. And uh, so far it's held pretty well. We also benefited from a couple weeks ago when there were mass protests. Maryland didn't have a lot of big protests. Um, we pilot tested street protesting a couple years ago with the Freddie Gray riots. Uh, so if any cities want to know what it's like when you have your police stand down for a couple years, uh, you can look at what Baltimore's crime statistics look like. It doesn't do well. Um, but we did not have huge marches, so we didn't have that uh, starting to get spread that as a catalyst to uh, increasing our numbers here. Thank you. Uh, one of our attendees has offered uh, some information. In Southern California, the union and the PHCC plumber schools have been continuing by internet. Uh, that's probably going on in a lot of places and appreciate uh, that comment. The next question we've got, <clears throat> excuse me, is in general, mask and social distancing are required in many cities. What about body temperature measurements when entering the company's facilities, shopping centers and restaurants, et cetera? We have it, it's case by case. Uh, I went in these lovely glasses I got a couple of weeks ago. I had to have my temperature checked at the eye doctor, but um, for the most part, it's not a very reliable indicator of whether or not you've got it or are contagious. Um, Cause I've heard anything from five to 10 days, you can have it and not have a temperature. Um, so in our building here, we wear a mask when we walk through the door. We have uh, three questions we have to answer. They log who we are and where we're going, but no temperature checks. 
Uh, but there are some employers that are doing it. It's uh, the EEOC did say you're allowed to do it as an employer. So it's not a discrimination risk. Uh, there was a question last week um, uh, on a uh, conference call with federal OSHA, whether or not that becomes uh, something that is loggable, whether uh, that's a medical uh, record that has to be saved for OSHA purposes or not. And as of now, the guidance is that it is not a medical record, somebody's temperature when they come in. Um, but that is a concern that some employers have that if you're, if you're checking temperatures, what liability does that open up for you down the road? Yeah. I mean, most uh, we, very similar here in, in Texas, we, it, it's not necessarily a requir requirement, but certain buildings I've gotten, I've gone personally to certain buildings and actually at government buildings that they ask, you know, to give me a temperature check and they give, you know, ask me the, the protocol questions that I, have I been exposed or, and, um, um, you know, have I been out of the country for the last, you know, couple of uh, last 15 to 30 days and, um, and they'll give you a little wristband um, to, so that you, you're, you're able to, to walk in with a particular building. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's pretty much spotty, particularly on, on temperature checks. Um, and that, that's, that's correct. Okay, and the last question that I've received up to this, <coughs> excuse me, up to this point, and this is directed to the commissioner, what are the preventive measures construction workers took in Maryland? Um, probably nothing that different than other states. We saw really early on um, social distancing and uh, fabric masks. Um, the uh, I come from the insulation industry, so um, we've been wearing masks in the insulation industry for 35, 40 years. So this is all just not that big a deal for me. Um, but for the other trades that weren't used to wearing masks, um, it takes some getting used to. But you see a lot of fabric masks on the sites, um, not a lot of N95s for people that don't need to wear N95s. Um, our state um, most plan put out a guidance document explaining the differences between respirators and 95 masks and fabric face coverings. Um, now they're pretty widespread, so there isn't a whole lot of pushback, but um, early on it was, um, it, there was a little bit of confusion of when you wear what kind, but uh, for the most part, uh, trying to keep guys apart. They have a log of um, who's on the job site, so if somebody does test positive, they can contact trace. Um, we've had some job sites get shut down when somebody does test positive and they'll go and contact everybody that was in contact with that, uh, that worker. But for the most part, um, our construction industry is, is a nice mix of residential and commercial, but we're nothing like in Houston where they're building houses uh, like they grow corn. Here, it's a, a busy month for us is a couple hundred houses statewide. All right. Well, that concludes the questions that I've been sent. Uh, so again, I would like to thank our speakers today, Representative Wally from Texas, Commissioner Hominiak from Maryland, uh, and thanks to all of the people who attended uh, this today. Uh, and again, thanks to all of our co-sponsors. And I hope the, uh, all of the rest of you have a good and safe day. Thank, thank you. you.